My name is Christina Ronneberg, and I'm a planner here at the North Central Texas Council of Governments. It's one of 24 Council of Governments in Texas. And for any of you who aren't familiar with Council of Governments, there are um, organizations that really work with local cities on a variety of quality of life issues, such as environment, energy, aging, um, disaster management. So we wear a lot of different hats. So, NCT COG is bringing you this webinar today because of the interest in LEDs that we've heard from North Central Texas cities, as well as that we want to share a couple of updates and new information about LED tariffs that are within the Encore Electric ter Territory, and then an LED business case report that is being developed by SPEAR, the South Central Partnership for Energy Efficiency as a Resource. So LED retrofits hold many benefits for cities and their citizens, from reduced costs to reduced emissions, improved illum illumination, safety, and it can be a great starting point for future smart city elements to, built on, to be built onto the light poles themselves. So to hear more about these benefits and the strategies for cities to transition to LEDs, we'll be hearing from four presenters today. First, Drew Villahan, a project manager with Kimley Horn, an engineering consultant firm. Then Adrian Valdez, senior project planning analyst with Encore Electric, the transmission and distribution utility that services much of the North Central Texas region. Followed by Brian Moen, assistant director of engineering transportation with the city of Frisco. And our last presenter today is Vince Dreeling, um, who's the Texas Manager of Business Development with Amoresco, which is an energy service company, which are commonly referred to as ESCOs. So before handing the webinar over to our presenters, I have a couple of quick housekeeping items. So first, please mute your phones. Second, for Q&A, please use the chat um, field that you have on your screen. And depending, so using the chat, um, field, you can either type in any issues you're having, whether they're associated with the audio, and any questions. So you can make the questions either specific for a specific presenter or just general for all the presenters. And depending on the number of questions we get in, we'll either be asking questions after each presenter or at the end of the webinar. Um, so this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be posted to the nctcog.org slash energy website, which is where you should have registered for this webinar. Um, that URL will be on the last slide, so it'll be easy for you to find. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. So um, Drew Villahan is a principal engineer um, and project manager in the Dallas office of Kimley Horn and Associates. She has over 12 years of experience in a variety of transportation and roadway lighting projects. She has designed several LED roadway lighting systems for area municipalities and TxDOT. Druva is proficient in performing photometrics using AGI32. She also developed cost estimates, detailed design, construction plans, and specifications. So, Druva, you should have control of the screen. Thank you, Christina. Uh, good morning, everyone. I will be talking about LED street lighting from an engineering um, perspective. So, uh, first of all, I would like to um, talk quickly about um, LED benefits. So, as we all know, uh, there are energy savings associated with uh, LED lighting. They have a longer lifetime, and also they need less maintenance. So um, more and more agencies these days are switching to LED or uh, converting their existing lighting to LED. So with that in mind, um, I will talk about the design process and the different steps as, as it relates to LED lighting. Um, I'll touch upon the design process, but I'll talk more about the lighting master plan process that's associated with LEDs as well as best practices that I've seen across the country. So the first step in the design process is to uh, develop a schematic or have a plan in mind. Um, so for different roadways, you may want to check your illumination warrants. So for example, um, TxDOT has uh, warrant conditions such as a roadway over 30,000 ADT could warrant uh, lighting or anything that has high nighttime crashes as, com 
as compared to daytime crashes could warrant continuous lighting. Uh, there are other warrants for uh, safety lighting, uh, which safety lighting would mean lighting, say, the intersections or crosswalks or anything that is like a conflict area. So again, uh, TxDOT has warrants such as 25,000 uh, ADT for urban areas or 10,000 um, uh, vehicles or ADT for rural areas and so forth. So those are good rules to use even for um, the, as we start designing LED lighting as to whether to do continuous versus safety um, for those systems. The next step, of course, is to see what your existing system is. Is it, um, is, is it high pressure sodium? Is it your old mercury vapor? And uh, are, those, uh, are your poles really old that the entire assembly needs to be replaced? and retrofits can, or, um, can be done, and so forth. So basically, this step would help evaluate the existing system. The next step is to uh, look at, of course, the preliminary pole placement. Uh, we want to avoid any underground and overhead utilities, and also um, look for any uh, proximity to airports. Um, FAA has certain forms, uh, like 7460, that need to be filled out if we are close to airports. Uh, railroad coordination is the other one that I'd like to mention as we start tracing poles and, and running conduit along the roadway. Uh, the other uh, one, of course, that needs to be started early on is the power provider coordination, such as with Encore, um, CoServe, and others here in the Metroplex, and check where we can centrally locate the electrical services so that we can um, feed our new LED lighting system. The design guidelines as such, um, the ones that we were using before for high-pressure sodium metal halide, they still apply for LED. Uh, for example, TxDOT Highway Illumination Manual, and then IESNA's most recent RP814. Uh, so they have specific standards for um, the lighting levels that need to be there for certain types of roadways and uh, land uses as well as pedestrian use. So these, um, we still use these for LED lighting designs as well. Uh, the other aspect of um, LED lighting uh, that needs to be checked is the photometrics. The uh, photometrics for LEDs is more directional. Uh, it can be better controlled. So it's very important to do a lighting level calculation and optimize the pole spacing. Uh, the other one, of course, is to check if there is light trespass. So for example, uh, what we do uh, when we lay out the poles is these are median mounted poles, so we are checking for any light that's outside the right of way or excessive light is outside the right of way. Uh, this specifically needs to be checked if our lighting uh, is adjacent to residential areas where people might complain about excess light. Um, and also this shows not only the lighting levels on the roadways and see that you know, the intersections are brightly lit and it's uniformly lit, but also, as I said, to check for um, any excess light in our system. Uh, electrical design. Uh, for LEDs, it is, uh, the concepts are the same, but as you can see, the, um, the, this shows the design amperes for luminaires. So for example, TechSot uses um, at 480 volts, for a 251 high pressure sodium, it's 0.75 amps, whereas now the new equivalent for the 250 watts um, high pressure sodium, um, you know, it's about 110 watts equivalent um, LED, uh, draws only about 0.4 amps. So there is definitely a benefit in lowering the, the electricity bill uh, if, if one switches to LED. And that translates to our electrical design, uh, where we are also seeing uh, lower um, or smaller wire sizes uh, for LEDs. Uh, again, National Electrical Code um, would be followed for LED lighting design. And um, the other aspect that's important is verifying the operating voltage. Uh, most of the high-pressure sodium systems used to be 24480, but um, LEDs I know are available even in 120 or even three-phase 277 as well as uh, the regular 240, 480, and so forth. So it's important to identify what operating voltage uh, we want to use and coordinating accordingly with the utility company. The other one is circuit routing. Uh, for LEDs, as I said, with the lower draw, the wire sizes are smaller, so we can go longer um, with, from the same electrical service. But it's, again, at the same time, it's important to follow the same um, H pattern, what I call the H pattern, 
with the electrical service in the middle and then going on each side of the service to serve your um, LED lights. The other one is um, doing the appropriate voltage drop calcs and conduit fill calcs. Um, and we are seeing the smaller wires, so you know, we are able to uh, go farther and use uh, even smaller cables for our uh, design. And this, uh, all those designs then feed back to your electrical uh, service design, and this, um, the power companies typically ask you for these loads uh, to the right, how, m how many KVA loads and so forth. And so we are also seeing lower loads uh, as we start to design LED lights which is of um, benefit, overall benefit to everybody. Um, the last step in the PSNE plans is, of course, to produce these kind of uh, plans where we uh, show where light poles are and make it ready for the contractor to go build and add any notes, this special notes that need to be added for, um, for the LED lighting system. Now let me touch upon the master plan process. Um, so instead of doing uh, for an LED lighting system, instead of doing a um, you know random selection of projects, it's very important to go through uh, an overall planning and to look at it from a top level uh, to define a system, what the future needs are, what the costs associated would be, and what the priorities are. And uh, that way the, the different agencies, once they have such a plan in place, uh, they can identify how and uh, which roadways to switch to LEDs first. So traditionally we've seen that you know, the street lighting system gets installed with the road widening projects. There might be a revitalization process or, uh, or even an aesthetics project that might um, add street lighting. But um, taking a step back, uh, it's very important to look at an overall planning process uh, in this case for the master planning. So um, as part of the master plan, also another important criteria is to identify what your standards will be. So for example, for LEDs, uh, do you want to do uh, decorative lighting for residential areas or for high pedestrian areas and cobra heads for your high speed arterials? Uh, do you want to do 4,000 Kelvin color temperature for uh, everywhere, or do you want to do it only for your arterials and maybe consider a warmer 3,000 Kelvin for uh, some of your residential areas? Um, so things like that, you know, verifying uh, what standards need to be there, what types of poles and, and so forth. Uh, the other one is, of course, to um, check where uh, your project's potential projects could be and prioritize them based on um, the traffic volume, pedestrian volume, high density development, uh, crime crash rate, and, and so forth. And of course, the associated funding. Uh, there are different funding mechanisms, um, energy environmental funds, sustainability funds, and um, other funds available uh, for LED lighting conversions as well as new installations. So with that, um, let me uh, summarize some of the best practices that I've seen across the, the country as I work on different projects. Um, the pilot test is the first, is, uh, comes to mind, um, so I know the other speakers after me will talk more about it, but it's important to do a test and check that uh, the warranties match what you want. I'm seeing a minimum 10-year warranty for fixture, driver, and entire assembly um, that nowadays the, the different agencies are starting to ask. Um, the other one is, um, does the new system have any dimming capability? And uh, for that, um, the LED fixtures, of course, need to have the seven pin receptacle and um, zero to 10 volt driver and, uh, and everything associated with it specified. Uh, but I'm seeing that, uh, for example, the city of Cambridge uh, said they have an additional 30% savings simply because they are doing dimming from midnight to about uh, 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, the other one, as I mentioned earlier, is to do the photometric analysis uh, to optimize your poles and not, uh, you know, for some locations, the one-to-one -one retrofit may not be ideal, especially if you have high pedestrian locations or crosswalks that need to be adequately illuminated. Uh, let me talk quickly about the bug rating. Uh, so bug, B-U-G, would stand for uh, backlight, uplight, and glare. It's important to check all those uh, metrics for LED fixtures to make sure that you know, your fixtures are exactly what you want for your use. 
uh, there's not a, a lot of backbite uh, and uh, light pollution outside the right of way. Uh, there's not a lot of uplight that might prohibit uh, people from seeing the um, dark sky, and not a lot of glare that might be a problem for uh, for the different road users. And then the other um, best practices I'm seeing are, of course. Um, connected streetlights. So um, some agencies, um, such as Arlington County, City of Cambridge, those are all going towards connected streetlights where they uh, remotely monitor uh, their, the health of their street lighting system. And I know the different vendors have different products, but it's, again, during the pilot test, it's really important to see uh, what works for your system and uh, what does not. The other one uh, that we are seeing more and more is the smart street lighting that's associated with uh, smart cities as well as um, going towards connected vehicles. And uh, we are seeing uh, light poles being used um, as a hot Wi-Fi hotspot for video detection and you know detecting any um, any uh, problems or incidents and so forth. So um, you know those, those are some other uh, additional uses that you can get out of your um, street lighting system, especially if it's an LED street lighting system that is uh, remotely monitored. So with that, I know I, I covered um, quite a range of um, subtopics. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me either by email or phone call. So with that, Christina, I'll hand it over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Druva. So um, because we are running a little bit um, short on time and I want to give enough time to each of our presenters, we're going to move forward with the next presentation and we'll have um, questions at the end. So our next speaker is Adrian Valdez with Encore Electric. Adrian has been a member of the Encore team for over two years now. His 12 years in the industry has covered various roles. His experiences as a streetlight technician, lineman, operations manager, and most re recently as a senior project planning analyst have helped him understand necessities for the technicians in the field installing lights and planning need needed for projects. Adrian oversees Encore's LED pilot and has been part of testing the newer generation of LED lights and streetlight monitoring technology. So I'm going to hand it over to you now, Adrian. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking today, and I hope I can share some information that will help with decision making on your LED installation programs. So Encore is responsible for about 400,000 streetlights. This is completed with the assistance of about 80 contract employees across our service territory. Our territory is roughly 60,000 square miles, and this equates to about one-third of the entire state of Texas. We have responsibility in over 400 different cities and communities in our system. On average, we average about 70,000 work orders created and uh, worked and repaired each year. The majority of our repairs are coming in from customers. And within our system, you'll find various streetlight uh, wattages from 53 watts to 1,000 watts. The vast majority of our system is going to be high-pressure sodium. Uh, while we still do have a mix of everything, it's, it's very heavy in high-pressure sodium. And we hope to be saying that the majority of our system is LED lighting in the very near future. So we began installing LEDs in 2010. Encore submitted RFIs to several potential suppliers. Our standards and engineering division played a key role in setting the standards for the products we needed. The first phase of the project was to install 500 Cobra headlights in six various areas in DFW. This consisted of five manufacturers. We then added 36 more post-top decorative fixtures in a seventh area, which brought in two additional manufacturers. It did not take long to see that some of the fixtures were failing. Uh, we found that some of the lights were very sensitive to storm activity. The surge protection on the lights have been dramatically improved over the years. And I think many folks just didn't realize the amount of lightning strikes that Texas received every year. In 2015, we began installing newer generation LED fixtures. And we had three vendors that were selected for this pilot expansion. We're currently monitoring 751 LED lights across our system. 
And the good news is that the newer products have been performing at a less than 2% fail rate. Our original pilot has some products performing at 50% or more of a fail rate just within a five-year period. So we also wanted to take advantage of some of our streetlight monitoring technology that was available. So all of our LEDs do have uh, monitoring technology on them. And one of the main benefits we immediately received was just knowing if our light was working or not. Uh, knowing we had an outage, a light was cycling, or a light had voltage issues, it just it immediately alerts us to send a technician out there to go investigate the problem we're having there. So the rest, so just knowing our light was immediately out, it just and it, it automatically improved restoration time. We're not waiting on a customer to report that light out. We can proactively go uh, repair that in our LED pilot areas. So we work closely with our LED manufacturers. So when a LED light fails, uh, we're able to provide them with data on how that light was performing before the failure. So. Pretty much every one of our manufacturers we have, they get that failed fixture back and they're able to send it back to their engineering team. And they're able to get back with us to tell us why it failed and, and what they're gonna be doing to help prevent that failure uh, for any future fixtures we receive. So it, it helped us out and I believe it just helped the industry out. It's helping the manufacturers see what the problems were. So here's one that I like with, with this monitoring technology. Uh, we all know lights can disappear in the field for various reasons. Storms and construction are a great example of that. Having monitoring technology gives us the capability to know if anything happens to that light. So once again, just immediately knowing if there's a problem out there, it, it alerts us and we can send a technician to go investigate. So some of the lessons learned from our pilot The pilot was a huge learning tool for us to get a good understanding of the LED products. This has been a key pilot in order for us to ensure we're selecting a quality light that will withstand the various weather and elements of Texas. Uh, the driver was a key part in determining the best manufacturer for our new generation of lights in our pilot. We learned from our first generation of LED lights that it was the driver that, that was failing the majority of the time. Uh, another key part of making sure the driver worked was to make sure we had a higher surge protection in all of our LED lights, and that, that goes back to lighting. Uh, high, higher surge protection seems to be more of a standard now with uh, newer LED streetlight products. So one of the first things that was obvious was just, um, you know, not every LED fixture was created equal. Uh, the, the technology was tested out to be a great idea, but it was just easy to see that the way the lights were engineered had a great role in the fill rate. Several of the first generation lights Encore installed were at a higher temperature as well, or CCT, than the industry standards today. Some of the first pictures installed in our pilot were at 6K. So compared to now, you know, most people hang around 3K or 4K, 6K was a lot higher. That's just what the uh, recommendation was in 2009 and 2010. So the initial cost of the LED fixture had a high price point. Uh, the cost of the majority of LED fixtures has decreased in a shorter period of time. So while the cost of the LED fixture is still higher than most HID products, it's still more affordable than it was in 2010. Let me see here. So why haven't we installed new lighting technology? So I would say it's a good thing that we did not go by hundreds of thousands of LED lights in 2009 and 2010. Uh, when the technology was in its initial phases. Our uh, pilot clearly showed that some products just were not ready at the time, and we feel confident now with the fixtures we have in place. Now, we were concerned that lights may not hold up to the Texas heat, when in reality, it was the storm season, storm season that tested our fixtures. Uh, the pilot gave us a great opportunity to observe the performance of several different products. It also gave the manufacturers a great opportunity to improve their products for our conditions. Uh, once again, a, a reliable streetlight fixture is a priority for us, and we do require that an LED fixture has a warranty of at least 10 years. So as I mentioned before, the cost of LED fixtures it is just starting to level, level out where it's beneficial for everyone. Uh, the lights were seven or $800 in, in 2010, and now they're averaging about $300 or just under $300. So the tariff, uh, we're currently waiting to fight really on our LED tariff. Um, 
We have hope that's going to be approved next month, and we're preparing to be installing LED lights in early 2018. And that covers my slides. I appreciate everyone's time today, and I hope this information can help you understand where we are with LED street lighting. And it's back to you, Christina. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so as I said before, we're going to wait until the very end of today's webinar for all questions. So our third presenter is Brian Moen with the City of Frisco. Brian is the Assistant Director of Engineering Transportation. Um, he has 24 years of experience in the traffic engineering profession, including the past 16 years with the City of Frisco. His experience includes work in traffic operations, traffic signal design and construction, intelligent transportation systems, wireless communications, roadway illumination, traffic safety, and multi-lane roundabouts. Brian graduated with a bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Nebraska. So Brian, the screen is now yours. All right, great. Thank you, Christina. Um, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining today. Going to kind of walk you through the process that we've gone through here in Frisco. Uh, we did a commenced a study several years back working in conjunction with Lee Engineering and Dharmesh Shaw to kind of work out. So I've got Dharmesh listed in here, and certainly when we're done, you can feel free to ask us both questions. Um, give you a little bit of background within the city of Frisco. As I mentioned, we started looking at alternative lighting in 2013. Uh, in the city of Frisco, we maintain all of our arterial street lighting. Uh, the power providers, Encore and CoServe, take care of things within our residential areas. At the time we were doing the study, we had about 5,000 metal halide fixtures. As I mentioned, the two different power providers that we have, so we have two different rates. Um, and then also, council is part of our dark skies ordinance, and as we were developing, getting engineering standards on the books around 2000, 2001, they had indicated they wanted to see white lighting as what they wanted. So that's where we got started on metal halide for most of our system right off the bat. Here's just a picture of our existing lighting. So we've got our poles, black poles here. Most of our stuff's 480 volt. We do have some mixture voltages though. And then we have post-op lamps in our downtown Main Street area that, that we also maintain and take care of. When we began the study, the, one of the things we wanted to try and figure out was LED or induction. You had induction was another product or possibility that was out there. Um, so we wanted to examine that. So we started, uh, we did a request for information. From that, we developed a short list. Then we did a pilot study. And going through, once that was done, doing an evaluation, looking at our payback analysis to see how things were going to work out for us. On our request for information, it was application-based. So we provided the vendors with, we have a 120-foot right-of-way set up for our six-lane arterials, 90-foot right-of-way for our four-lane. As we were looking at that, we had a Buy America mandate included in that. We requested shop drawings. Uh, we wanted their installation and maintenance requirements, what their list prices were, um, at least a five-year warranty, um, and also seeing what was available. We also looked at retrofit kits, and then lighting control systems were considered at that time as well. When we, after our following the RFI, we had 15 vendors actually respond. So we had four folks that provided some information on induction lighting and then 13 with an LED. You can see the cost ranges at the time in 2013 on what we saw. Um, I think the biggest thing, one of the things we figured out going through this process anyway, but at least retrofit just really wasn't an option. It reduced your warranty time and really provided little cost advantage. You still have that maybe in a post-op environment, but certainly on Cobra Head, I think you're better off just changing out the entire fixture versus doing retrofits. But they do have, and folks are willing to make them for you if that's what you want, not the way you want to go. Um, technology down there, you had induction. It's been around a long time. It's proven, um, but certainly it wasn't really changing. And then LED was rapidly improving back at that time still. Uh, from through the RFI, we had vendor presentations. So we had two with induction, six with LED. Uh, following those presentations, we pretty much decided we weren't going to consider induction any further, at least for the arterial roadways. Um, and it was basically just for those reasons listed there on the slide. Our pilot study uh, was our next phase. So we had selected five vendors. Uh, we had four of them actually provide us with text, uh, test fixtures. And then based, using that, then we did a photometric analysis and we compared it to what 
we would measure in the field versus the photometric files that were provided by the vendors when we looked at that. So we wanted to see where we really, you know, you get those, if you use AGI 32 and you're doing photometrics, are we really getting what those, uh, the software is telling us that we should be getting? Uh, visual, upon visual op observation, we certainly could see that the LEDs were better than our existing metal halide. You didn't have the hot spots that we were seeing before. We had much better uniformity, and we're doing a better job of getting lighting out under a sidewalk, but also, I think, lessening the light trespass areas past the right-of-way. And then it gave us, too, a chance to actually do wattage measurements to see. You know, one of the things to me that was surprising early on is you have a 250-watt metal halide. It's advertised like that, and you think, well, hey, that's what it is. And lo and behold, you get out there, and you're actually drawing 295 watts um, as your power usage. So just wanted to verify with the, what the LED vendors were saying their wattages would be and then what we were actually seeing. It also gave us an opportunity for our technicians to work with the fixtures. You know, how much time was it going to take? Are there advantages, disadvantages between them and how they mount onto the Davin arms? Um, and then we looked at time because our initial thought when we got into this is we were going to be trying to do most of the changing out ourselves um, as time goes by. And so these were all considerations into our cost and payback analysis that we were looking at. For our pilot study, we had a roadway, El Dorado Parkway, here in the city of Frisco. Uh, we had the vendors side by side. We used three poles minimum between them. So when, when we went out to do the measurements, you could see the light that was coming from poles around it. What was another thing that was really good about this particular section is it had an open field to the south and just residential to the to the north. So and then in this corner was a retail corner, but you could see that it was vacant yet. So there wasn't a lot of other ambient light in the area. So we were really truly getting what the LEDs were putting down. And then all around it was metal halide then that, that we were going. So I would suggest if you can set up something like that, that's a good thing if you're trying to see performance between them and whatnot. And then based on our measurements, we used a heat map, um, just in Excel, so you can kind of see the differences of the measurements. We set up a grid on the pavement went out and took, our, took the measurements and then put them into here so we could then look at our minimum and maximum uniformity and so on and compare the differences between the, the actual vendors that we were looking at. This slide here, um, I didn't update it, um, but this is one example. So when we went and did all of our calculations, uh, one of our power providers, we were at 11 cents per kilowatt hour. And you can see down here, we've got fixture cost, and then it's giving your payback time to break even point. And really where we're at now, we're seeing our fixture costs are more down in the 220, 230 range. And so at least on for this particular power provider, we're seeing payback closer to around two-year time frame. Um, our other provider, we've got a much better rate, but then certainly then that impacts your payback time um, or we're more up maybe into the six to seven year range still, even with fixtures getting down closer to $225 uh, when you buy them in large quantities. So where are we now? LED is our standard for new installs, so all of our new designs as we're doing them, uh, we're going through that process and, and all LEDs what's being put up. We just recently put out a bid to finish the replacement of our arterial lighting. Our, we had good intentions of having our staff do that. Um, we were working through that, but you know, as many of you, if you're public agencies, you know, other things come up and your folks get tied up doing other things. So we just had made the decision to go ahead and bid the rest of them out and get the change change out done. So we're hopeful that all of our, except for post-op lamps, that will be all LED by December of 2017. Uh, the post-op lamps are more expensive to convert, just the fixtures themselves. Um, they, they cost quite a bit more than, than the Cobra heads do. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, payback through one provider, we're at just over two years, and the other one we're going to be around the six to seven. And then we're starting to explore control systems. We considered that early on, um, but at the time it was, it was just they were kind of all over the place or very expensive. So we made sure that the lighting we were buying, we had the NEMA connector, um, available, the seven pin connector, so we could have that. We've got drivers that can do dimming, um, so we can add those things uh, later on. This is just kind of a number status, so we've got about 6,200 fixtures that we maintain. Um, we're about 2,400 of them are LED currently. And then LED conversions, what we had completed was roughly almost 1,300 ourselves. 
in the same time frame as how many new were added to the system. And then what was remaining to convert is 3244, and that's what we just bid. So for about just about $1.2 million, these last 3,200 fixtures are being changed out by a contractor. So the fixture cost was roughly about just over $900,000 for those fixtures, and then uh, the cost to actually have a contractor come in and change them all out for us, and they can do it in about three months and get those done. So all said and done, what we'll have left are the post-op lamps and then just percent of the system LED. Recommendations, if you're looking to go, I think you've heard Dhruva mention it and, and so on, but I would require minimum 10-year warranty. Um, usually it is the driver is really what's the issue. The LED technology is there, so you need to look at who your LED makers are, but then also the driver is really what's in there. Um, don't forget control systems. You know, At least get that NEMA socket set up so you can add it later. I think the control systems are starting to get better um, and maybe more cost effective. It just seemed initially there wasn't much. It was kind of like if you're familiar with signal systems, we had things early on where they weren't too too standardized and there was wide ranging variability in products. And I think we're starting to see the manufacturers uh, get things closer together. So think smart city applications, you heard that earlier. Um, you know, the lights, we're finding they can do more. We've had done some recent analysis on our polls on how much structural capacity they have for us to add other devices and things on there to uh, help with other things um, in controlling traffic and also other smart city applications. The costs continue to go down, but they have slowed, so I think you know, you're not seeing the big drops in price. It's kind of starting to even out, but you're still seeing improvement in the LED technology and the efficacy of the lamps. Um, you need to know your kilowatt hour rates. That's your biggest impact on your payback if you're starting to look at that. Be aware of finance options out there for your change out. You'll have a lot of folks who are willing to come in and, and change them out for you um, at no at basically no cost to you up front. And, but what you'll need to do then is you're paying back the electrical savings that you have over time. You just continue to basically pay like the same electric bills you do now, but the cost savings goes back to the vendor who's done the change out. Um, but it's an easy way to get in without spending, you know, necessarily money up front. You just don't necessarily see the cost savings in your pocket. Uh, the vendor gets those. Um, and then 3K versus 4K, uh, we're all facing that. Uh, we've recently just uh, worked through that process ourselves. We're going to continue on on 4K for our materials. Um, and I think some of that for you is going to make a difference if you've got a lot of high-pressure sodium around right now. 3K is probably going to be fine. It looks better than, than the HPS does. Um, but if you're already a metal halide or more of the white light, when you see a 3K lamp come up and you put them side by side, your personal preference is probably going to need to be or want to stick with the 4K. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Christina. Be available for questions or if you want to reach out to Dharmesh too for some questions on how he helped us through the process. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Brian. Um, so we're about to move on to our last presenter, Vince Dreeling with Amoresco. So Vince is the Texas Manager of Business Development at Amoresco, Inc. He is a licensed professional engineer and has led the sales or technical, technical development of over 50 million in energy efficiency projects throughout the Southwest. Amoresco has recently been awarded the LED streetlight conversion project for both the city of Phoenix and the city of Chicago and already completed numerous smaller cities throughout the region. Um, handing it over to you, Vince. Thanks, Christina. And I know a few of these slides will be repetitive, so I'll try to click through them um, for everyone so we can get to the end for questions. Um, I think we've covered why a lot of cities are moving to LEDs. One thing I'd like to touch on, though, you know, and Druva mentioned as well, there can be a big difference on energy savings, um, whether or not you properly do uh, a lighting design along with your project and then also utilize controls. So the projects we did in Tucson with that design and then controls, we saw up to a 79% reduction um, rather than just your 55 to 60% reduction for standard retrofits. Um, and the, the other big one is reduced maintenance. You know, as you, as you can see, typically you're doing relamped and reballasts on your HPS lights and your metal halides. Your LEDs eliminate some of that. Um, drivers are what we say fail as well, so I think that's something that you've heard consistent between all the presenters, uh, but drivers are typically what we're seeing fail when we see failures on the LEDs. 
Um, a couple of conversions specific to Texas. Um, do you own your lights? You know, I think Brian mentioned that uh, they own their roadways, but not the residentials. Um, if not, are you looking to purchase them? Um, does your tariff match? Uh, with this being a lot of folks in the Encore territory, service territory, I think that's very relevant. Um, and we know that, that hopefully that rate case is approved and moves forward next year. Um, and then ultimately financing. So there are financing programs available that aren't necessarily um, vendor financing programs where they take the benefits. So there's, there's third party financing available that is very similar to a, a bank loan or even lower interest rates than, than bonds. Um, Streetlight controls were mentioned and it, we think that they're very important and really the, the way of moving forward um, that gives you the ability to provide all the monitoring for where your streets are on and off, where the lights are on and off. Um, it also provides you the ability to the, do the dimming and the smart city applications. Um, similar to controlling the light output through that, with the, you can use dust to dawn trimming. Um, you're also able to vary the lumen output. So as the lights degrade over time, you can actually ramp up the power so that when they're first installed, maybe you power them at 70% to meet your light levels. And then as the LEDs degrade, you can increase the power output over the time and maintain consistent lumen output through the life cycle of those fixtures. Also outside of Texas, one of the things that we're seeing um, is that utilities are allowing cities to use controls to actually meter their energy use. So rather than putting the lights on a tariff, um, they're actually going to a metered service and metering through the lighting controls. That saves the cost of putting all those uh, poles and circuits on a metered circuit. Um, we've seen that in multiple places in Washington. Uh, we're not sure if that's going to become a statewide trend on the West Coast or if that will uh, grow into this region, but it's something to take into consideration. A little bit on how to procure. So, you know, we are a design build contractor and we really believe that the design build method is superior for lighting systems. And the primary reason for that is, is really just the speed at which the technology is moving in the industry. Um, using the design build process, which is what Phoenix and Chicago have elected to do, um, they can put together a team that includes an ESCO like ourselves, and then multiple sub consultants. So Phoenix, for example, there's four consulting engineers that are working with us, each with their own specialty. So we have a consulting engineer for the airport lights, another one for tunnel lights, one for roadways, and then an electrical engineer to work through the residentials. And it allows the city to really put into place the consultants and the people that they wanna work with on their project. And then ultimately they get to know what the costs of that project are going to be prior to implementation so that they can put the right budget dollars in place um, and, and have a guaranteed max price before they start construction. Um, part of that process, when you work with an ESCO, um, we, on our projects, we require the GIS audit. So similar to what Dhruva said, we think field conditions um, matter more than as built. So we go audit every existing fixture um, look at light levels and look at uh, GIS locations. And then, you know, go beyond just your typical one-for-one -one replacement. Um, and I think Brian also mentioned no retrofits. I would agree that that's a, a best practice. You want to replace fixtures um, on the Cobra heads. And then, you know, color temperature can, can also be very important. We've heard multiple people say it's moving to the, you know, three or four K. Now, so Spear has put together a business case that shows, you know, what does an actual project like this look like in today's environment in Texas? Um, I've helped put that together with Spear and that business case is available on their website. It looks like this slide, uh, the spacing got off a little bit, but as you can see, this was a situation, um, a, a hypothetical situation, but with real numbers. So we just used a, a hypothetical city. Um, we're gonna finance with a tax exempt lease purchase. So that, that is project financing, but that's not, that is third-party financing, not financing that's shared with any vendor. 
So it's similar to a, an equipment lease at an interest rate that's similar to your bond funds. We used a 15-year term um, to match the, the life cycle of the equipment. And really part of that was because we wanted to use real electric rates. So we modeled a city that had um, yeah, 3.6 cents per kWh on, the, on their utility rate, uh, retail rate. And we used a population of around 100,000, um, 7,600 fixtures with a distribution, as you can see, 40% um, of those being 100 watts and then distributed on up through the, the larger wattage fixtures. Um, a project like this would include, as I mentioned, the GIS study to map existing fixtures, turnkey installation, materials, project management, engineering, and light level commissioning. So your, your all-in costs there as you, as you go through that are 2.7 million, roughly. And if we look at project paybacks on the next slide, we can see that the projected annual energy cost savings is just over uh, $200,000 a year. We guarantee 90% of those savings and run them out through a cash flow for those 15 years with uh, just under $8,000 a year in that annual benefit. So with that, I will um, turn it back over to you, Christina. Perfect. Well, first, I just want to give a big thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, and we do have a number of questions that came in. So, and then also a number of the questions that came in, I think a couple, they could be appropriate for a number of the presenters. So all presenters, please unmute your phones now. Um, so the first question, though, is for Adrian. Um, and the question is, for cities who don't own their own streetlights, what's the process for taking over ownership from the utility? So the, that's, uh, I'm not gonna be the best person to answer that question, uh, but my email is there. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a popular question in the audience today. So my email's there, feel free to email me. Okay, perfect. We well, we have another question on the topic of ownership. So because ownership is such a big um, topic in terms of the retrofits becoming cost effective. Um, so since so the question is about whether there is the city ownership and then the utility ownership, is there another ownership method that can work for a city as well? Um. I don't, I think those are the, gonna be the two main options, but once again, that's another one, just I, I will get you to the right person to get that answer. Okay, well, Druva, Brian, or Vince, do either of you three have an answer to that question? So, I, hey, Christina, this is Vince. I'll mention one other option that we've seen um, in, in other states. We haven't seen it happen yet here in Texas. Um, but Arizona is a good example where they're actually using the, the P3 method, a public-private partnership, and a third-party entity um, capital provider is coming in and taking ownership of all the state lights. So the Arizona DOT is looking to move their lights to uh, the P3 model to include third-party maintenance, et cetera. So that would be a, an alternative uh, ownership method as well. Okay. So Christina, I don't know if the two options you gave me, I don't know if metering was one of those options you provided. So, of course, we have our, our Schedule A lighting and our Schedule D lighting. Um, but metering is also another option where Encore provides a point of delivery. And these three options are, are based on, on PEEVES, on the Public Utility Commission. Okay, great. That's that's helpful. Um, no, so this the, the P3 method that Vince mentioned, when we've looked to do our last change out of the remaining, that was one of the proposals we had before us and that we considered. So I think you're seeing that out there as well. Well, they would just take over maintenance and operations and they were even willing to take over all the ones that we already had converted to bring those on as well and figure that into the cost and they would be responsible for maintenance and operations. Great. Um, so our next question isn't for any specific presenter. Um, it is 
So we've heard anecdotally that less copper and associated theft is seen with LEDs. Are there any other surprising benefits that have been seen? I wish, it would, I wish people wouldn't knock them down as frequently as the others, but that doesn't seem to change anything. <laughs> I would say um, LED has, you know, it's kind of, it's not a surprising benefit, but uh, there was a survey done um, when compared when comparing LEDs to high pressure sodium, and people said they felt more secure with LED lighting than with the high pressure sodium because of the better um, color rendering index. So people could differentiate between the, um, you know, the colors of the other cars or what uh, the colors of the uh, what people were wearing and their faces as compared to high pressure sodium. Okay, yeah, safety is definitely a big, um, a big top issue that we've heard about with LEDs. Um, so this next question again is not for a specific presenter. It is, um, are there, has anyone heard any of any health risk, risks or complaints received from citizens associated with the LEDs? So for, um, you know, one of my clients, not in Texas, but outside, uh, they have um, heard repeated complaints about the AMA report that came out uh, in June last year. It talked about LEDs um, you know, impacting sleep cycles uh, and the circadian rhythm. And um, they recommended 3,000, the AMA recommended 3,000 Kelvin or lower. And um, the agency that I'm working for, they use 4,000 Kelvin um, as their standard. And uh, we actually reached out to IES and NEMA and uh, USDOE, and we found that um, all three agency, agencies still support the 4,000 Kelvin uh, color temperature. There is no uh, valid and long research enough to prove that the higher temperature color, uh, higher color temperature LEDs impact sleep cycles. So I'd say, uh, yes, we have heard complaints about that. Um, the second complaint that we've heard is the uh, dark sky. So Inter International Dark Sky Association, it's more prominent in um, Arizona and some of the East Coast cities. Uh, but they are, again, saying that it needs to be 3,000 Kelvin or lower and, you know, lower uh, wattage and so forth. But again, I would say that, um, you know, for those, uh, it, it needs to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it needs to be, those cases need to be evaluated that way. Just, just uh, saying that color temperature alone is actually not responsible for uh, people not being able to see the dark sky. There are other, um, other uh, pollution sources such as lighting from parking lots, parking garage buildings that overall contribute to it. Thank you, Dhruva. Um, the next question is for Adrian. So Adrian, you had mentioned that Encore was able to test out um, bulbs from, or LEDs from a number of different manufacturers, and the, um, the individual wanted to know if you could share which LED brand perform, had the best performance. Well, I can share which three manufacturers uh, we've used in our in our pilot extension. Um, I don't really want to get into too much specifics on the fill rates uh, for the brand names, but General Electric, Cree, and American Electric. Um, those are the three vendors that have performed very well for us. Okay, great. Um, the next question is for Brian. So the question is, your retrofit schedule seems very ambitious. Was it part of, it, was it designed to meet an energy or sustainability goal or anything like that? No, it wasn't. Uh, when we went out for bid for the change out for those last 3,000, it was the best value. So the vendors were proposing those schedules and that figured in as a percentage of our selection in addition to cost and, and reference you know, their prior work. Um, so that was a schedule that they proposed and came back. We just had to provide them. We finished all of our GIS audit and things for them, so they knew all the locations, and we've given them the details, but that's what they told us that they can meet. Okay, so I just wanted to let everyone know quickly that we have about four more minutes for any questions, so please feel free to continue typing any in. Um, 
One more that we have for Adrian right now is that you mentioned that you'd like to see more LEDs make up um, as overall in the street lights. Do you have a goal or for LEDs to overtake the high pressure sodium lights? What I do know for a fact now is, is we're planning to start installing these um, early next year. Um, hopefully we can get about uh, 25,000 lights installed in 2018 and 2019, about 30,000 lights, and just continue that on forward. Okay, well, I think that was all the questions that came in. Um, I think everyone has the contact information for our four presenters today, and then as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the URL that's shown on the screen, so the nctcog.org slash energy. And so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any of the presenters or to myself, and thank you so much for joining today. Um, and with that, this webinar is concluded.